fondest memory of a distant childhood in a distant Korea was when she used to visit her grandmother's house. There, dropped like a patch of vibrant green and molded concrete, was the madang, the courtyard within a traditional Korean home, an outdoor living room, if you will. It was there where Grace Kim first played make-believe, creating a space where real life and the abstract first met. For Dr. Grace Kim, professor and writer of theology and the Korean-American experience, the Madang is a sacred place for guests to openly share their experiences and work, a place where real life and ideas are up for discussion. This podcast welcomes guests to speak openly on modern issues in religion and culture. The Madang is open. I invite you to come in, converse, and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang. It's so exciting to have Dr. Diana Butler Bass with me this today to talk about her latest book, Freeing Jesus. She has a PhD from Duke University and she has over 10 best selling books. And this is her latest book, Freeing Jesus. So it's a great pleasure to have you with me, Diana. It's been so long since, you know, with the pandemic, and we're just yeah. kind of in our rooms or our cottages as you are so but I had a chance to read your book and I was like this is such an important book and I feel like you wrote it just for me <laughs> so do you want to just share about how you came um, to write about this book freeing Jesus oh that's a great question um I, my last book was on gratitude and mm -hmm. um one of the things that I realized that it when I was working on that project was how, uh, how grateful I was um, to be turning 60, to have had a very, you know, enriching, I think, uh, spiritual journey where I learned tons. And I was looking around and, and realized that a lot of my younger friends were really struggling theologically. You know, you hear a lot about people deconstructing or leaving Christianity altogether. And I guess I just wanted to put my story out in the world to help my friends. And okay. so the way the book was first constructed, and you'll, I think you'll get a kick out of this, uh -huh. th that I had imagined that I would write an eight chapter book that looked at sort of eight major theological points. I was mm -hmm. going to look at the end times and what the Bible was and how you, we understand salvation and a whole, whole chapter on Jesus. So, so there was going to be like, a, it was going to be like a systematic theology for people uh -huh. who are lost. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that was what the intention was. <laughs> and so, so what I the started- result is so different. <laughs> I know, it's really funny. <laughs> Well, what, what happened was I, so here I was, I had this whole book constructed. My publisher was very excited about it. And um, I, I, I looked at it and I said, oh, where do I want to start? Because I never start at the beginning. I just start with something, you know, that calls me. And so I thought, I'll start with a Jesus chapter. And so I sat down and I started writing. I wrote 80 pages of that ch <laughs> one chapter. And oh my God. And you I went, amazing. I went, oh my gosh, you know, it took me a whole summer. And uh -huh. I thought, if I write eight chapters of 80 <laughs> pages each, this is not going to work, you know. So I, I called my publisher up and said, um, I think I'm writing a book about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they were a little reticent about that um, at first, but I convinced them that I could roll many of the ideas uh -huh. the theological ideas into yeah. talking about Jesus. And so that's where it came from. It was this, you know, I just want to share uh -huh. stuff about how you can stay Christian yeah. with people I know who are struggling with that. Yeah. And, and what that's, resulted was the book yeah. about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that's why I find it so important because I felt like you were writing it to me because even I struggle and my, you know, everybody struggles with Christianity. My struggle is the masculinity of Christianity. So the male God and the male Jesus. So I, you know, 
after my first book, The Grace of Sophia, I never returned to Jesus. I just kept looking at the spirit. So that's why I thought your, your book, Freeing Jesus, was so refreshing. So you have, you know, and you share a lot, which was so funny. Some of the parts got me rolling on the floor laughing. But, your, you know, your chapters are Jesus as friend, teacher, savior, Lord, way, and presence. And I thought that was so beautifully put together. And it was like pull, taking me on a journey to finally say, okay, I can't get rid of Jesus anymore. <laughs> because your last chapter on presence, you kind of, um, I can't say it, but uh, like you say it, everything you write is so beautiful and I can't articulate it very well. So people have to read it and look for it. But when you're talking about Jesus as present, you said you can't separate the Jesus from the spirit. And I thought, is Diana speaking to me? Because that's what I've been doing to kind of help myself get rid of Jesus in a way. Not, I can't, and I always tell everybody, I'm not throwing Jesus out, but it was just so hard because of the church background that I have where Jesus is male. So if you can just say a bit more, because that just moved me and touched me so much. So if you can say more about that. Um, I'm glad to. The, the whole book mm -hmm. is written in what I call memoir theology. And I'm sure that you'll probably, yeah. that you wanted to talk about that yeah. a little bit more. No, yes. I'd be very so, surprised yeah, remind, if you didn't. Yeah. I know, remind <laughs> me to come back to that because that's another question I had. So go ahead. Yeah, so I, <laughs> a little, I jumped the gun a little bit there, yeah, but uh -huh. it's important in answering this question because me too, you know, that, that whole question of Jesus as being a male, um, I mean, you and I both know, that is a classic question of feminist theology yeah. is what good is a male savior yeah to, that's to why women? i was hesitant for you mm -hmm. oh my goodness this strong feminist voice is going to write about jesus but it was so refreshing okay continue on sorry to interrupt so much i'm just so <laughs> excited about the book <laughs> so continue well, on. well i'm really happy about your response because what i think it says you know for both of us is that what I've written is an incredibly strongly feminist book. Yeah. Um, but I did it in such a way that I don't come out and I just say, everybody, hey, you're going to read about the feminist Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah. What I invite people to is reflecting on the Jesus they've known through their lives. And mm -hmm. because I'm a woman, um, mm -hmm. that Jesus appears uh, in a particular set of stories and around a particular frame. And so... I looked at my own life as a text mm -hmm. and I thought, how does Jesus show up um, when I'm in my earliest memories? And how mm -hmm. does Jesus show up when I'm in elementary school? How does, how did I understand Jesus when I was in adolescence? How did I understand Jesus when I was, you know, sort of full on teenager going off to college? And so I look back at, at my own life and I realized that Jesus emerged in some pretty strong ways um, mm -hmm. as friend, as teacher, as savior, which was a really interesting chapter to write out. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back that, to that. <laughs> yeah. That chapter and the Lord, the Lord chapter are there's some really harrowing stuff in the middle yeah. of the book about but when you mentioned Jesus. savior was only mentioned twice yeah. that caught me off guard because that's what was so ingrained at, in my head about Jesus as savior yeah. but anyway go back to the presence part because we're, I don't want to uh, interrupt your thought uh, so the the book, the, the bulk of it takes place up until about the time I'm 45, maybe late 40s. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I'm looking more at recent experience. And that's the chapter called Jesus's present presence. Yeah. And this is the place where I think that, you know, if you and I were teaching a theology class <laughs> together, what fun that would be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should do it one of these days. No, we should. Too many good ideas. <laughs> but, 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 you know, we both know this is that our ideas about Jesus are really strongly shaped by the creeds that have been imprinted upon us. Mm -hmm. 
And those creeds come out of the philosophical imagination of what becomes Western Christianity primarily. The East uses those creeds too, but we think of the most people who are associated with Western cultures or who have been in cultures missionized by Western cultures have these creeds in their mind and we have them in our minds through largely the way white men have interpreted those creeds. Yeah. And so we have this creed that says that God is three in one and one in three and that the, that God exists as one complete being who nevertheless exists in three persons mm -hmm. and so that i think when you say you know it's really hard for me to get away from jesus as being male yeah. and that mm -hmm. was my experience too yeah it's because i'm kind of hung up there is yeah. that i'm trying to think really hard mm -hmm. about the separation of the three persons mm -hmm. which i you know is a little different for you and i because of you being asian american and me being western but i gotta uh -huh. tell you i was brainwashed by that stuff <laughs> <laughs> thank you for admitting it because every time i say stuff like that nobody believes me <laughs> well, well thank you for saying it. i mean literally it was like if you ever say that there's any confusion between the two between the three persons some person will yell at you some male male authority figure some theologian somewhere some professor you can't do that yeah. but yet you you know, a fair reading of the New Testament, mm -hmm. those lines are really blurry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, between where Jesus ends and the spirit begins mm -hmm. and how Jesus relates to yeah. Abba, uh -huh. um, what Jesus called the, the, the person Jesus refers to as father. Um, and so, you know, it, it's really Western philosophy says you can't confuse the persons because they have to be distinct. But the truth of the matter is, is the New Testament record is not that clean because it's not Western. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have that Roman idea in individual entity. Mm -hmm. And so I work in that presence chapter to recover the blurriness. Uh -huh. That's why I just felt, you know, it, it's like a little journey. And then that just hit it home for me, because that's the part I struggled with. You know, your book is so rich in history. That's your background, right? Church history. It's so rich in biblical studies, because, you know, some people accuse us more progressive folks. Oh, you're not using scripture. <laughs> so but your book is just full of that. And then, you know, it is a lot of memoir. So I wanted, to, you know, and then in your conclusion, I just laughed when um, you had that little dialogue and said, why aren't we studying these other women in the early church? And then, and then that, was it a professor? Now I can't recall, yeah. said, oh, that's memoir. It's not theology. So I just laughed so hard because I get that all the time. So can you you know, earlier you mentioned memoir. So can you come back to that about how this book is like a memoir, but it is so heavily theological and biblical and church history. Like I just felt it was like a textbook with some stories in it. It was very intense at times. So I appreciated it so much as a scholar and then just as a person in the church would appreciate it. So say more about the memoir part and the memoir theology. It's funny that you would bring that up because uh, <laughs> the, the textbook part of it, yeah. because the very first professional review, there haven't mm -hmm. been too many book reviews out yet, but the book list review came out mm -hmm. about three or four days ago. And that reviewer said, this book teaches you so much about theology. And uh -huh. then it said, but don't worry. <laughs> That's what I would say too. I haven't gone and read your reviews and we have to remind everyone it's coming up March 30th. Right. But that that's very interesting because that's how I felt too. It's it there's just so much information right. that people need to know. Uh, and it really is challenging because you know, I always tell my first year class, you know, theology is biography and biography is theology. And I think some students get it, some don't, but we come to know 
God and Jesus and spirit through our experiences. And that's why you share a lot of your experiences in the book. And I thought, wow, you know, some things I knew, you know, just by your other talks and so forth, but there were so many interesting um, bits of it. And it really is, I think, this feminist model that other folks need to recognize and use and share even in preaching and teaching and wherever we are, because that to me really spoke a lot about memoir. And, you know, I struggle with that all the time. If we share a memoir, is it real theology? Because white men keep saying, that it isn't and then you went on to say well Augustine and you know he shared his life struggle which is mm -hmm. true so when men do it it's okay and then when women do it it isn't yeah. so I, I thought it was great for you to put that in yeah. and that that was really the point that that professor mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. um you know when we had I said why aren't we studying more women or can we read more books by women it wasn't really a challenge because i was a very pliant young woman when i was in my 20s and um so i just i just was curious i kind of what i you know I, I wanted to know what was there and um the professor literally said to me well w women don't write theology and then mm. i i thought well you know i've heard of names you know like Teresa of Avila, Catherine, yeah. Anna, you know, I mean, I've heard names before. Uh -huh. And so, uh, so Dorothy Day, you know, I mean, I've uh -huh. heard people. Yeah. And, and so I, I kind of threw those back at him and said, you know, well, what about these people? And he said, well, oh, they didn't write theology. They wrote memoir. Yeah. And so I've carried that with me for 40, almost 40 years. Oh, wow. I, I mean, I think I heard that when I was first, when I was in my mid twenties, yeah, about oh. 23 and I'm 62 wow. now. So it's been about 40 years. <laughs> and I finally got to the point where it was just like, well, oh, wait a second. You know, when Augustine uh -huh writes about stealing pears or <laughs> yeah. how he's like so broken hearted because he kicked his own concubine out of the <laughs> you know <laughs> and because yeah. he can't sleep with her anymore because yeah. he's now, now a christian um or when martin luther <laughs> you know martin luther says here i stand i can do no other or john wesley says my heart was strangely warm yeah you know, it's like, oh, for pity's sake, you know, what, what is that? You know, <laughs> that's memoir. I, I know. <laughs> and what happens is those, those men, um, and, and we could come up with a lot more examples, but Fra Francis of Assisi stripping his clothes off, going to the village, saying that God told him to rebuild the church. I mean, literally every time you turn around and look at something a man wrote, it comes out of his experience but it's been privileged into this other category yeah. that we call theology. And so in a sense, it's church elevated memoir. <laughs> and it's memoir that the church insists has to colonize all the rest of our memoirs. Yeah. And oh, that, I... that's the part that really gets me yeah. because it's like, you know, a lot of people talk about decolonizing theology right uh -huh. now. Well, yeah. the truth of the matter is, is that man we've all got to do it yeah mm -hmm. um you know here i am white woman uh blessed by levels of privilege that i still am exploring but the truth of the matter is is that i feel still even at 62 like my is my story less than augustine's story you know those well, questions, think, yeah. questions haunt me you know and and then i kind of wake up from that haunting dream and i say no they're both just stories mm -hmm. and what has to happen i'm convinced in uh -huh. for christian theology to move forward into a real global guise and a genuine form of i think the pluralism that was always intended to be mm -hmm. is that we have to bring so many more stories to the table mm -hmm. And, you know, part of my sadness, and I, I do mention this in the book, I can imagine myself preaching on it a little bit more as the, the book unfolds, uh, you know, in public. Um, how many, how many of those memoirs have been lost? Mm -hmm. How yeah. limited is our view of Jesus, because the church only approved of 
several dozen of these memoirs as theology. And what, how has that limited our view of Jesus? I mean, I think these are really serious questions. Mm -hmm. And so in writing this book, those are questions that I intended to press Mm -hmm. um, towards the end in a gracious and life-giving and I think um, inviting way. Yeah. Well, I, and you just said this all so beautifully too, but to decolonize our minds and scripture and theology is, it's a must. Otherwise, I think we are just going to just die off if we don't do that. So I just appreciated that so much. And I was laughing because of our other, you know, you and I talking about memoir just before all this, before I got really into your book. So I thought this is so important. And if, if people want to get to that, that's in the conclusion part. And then I just, you know, at the beginning, and I've, we, you and I spoke at this feminist conference many years ago in Indianapolis. And I remember I heard you speaking about you being from a Quaker family, but your ancestors, so the first immigrants here. And you talked about it here again in the book and you bring in Quakerism and then, you know, understanding a friend. So if you want to say more, because and I was interested in it because I'm a Presbyterian ordained, but I teach at Earl, which is a Quaker <laughs> school. So, you know, it is so, I don't want to say polar opposites, but it is so different from my background. And, you know, and earlier um, in this conversation, you were talking about creeds and, you know, they don't have creeds, but the concept of friends, um, I think is kind of, it, it, it's worthwhile to explore. And maybe your readers have never heard of Quakerism because it's so small today. So I thought it was very enriching to read that part. So if you want to say a bit more. Oh, uh, well, the first chapter is the idea of Jesus as friend. And because it's a memoir, the Mm -hmm. place that that arises from is literally going back and sort of scouring my childhood memory and asking myself the question, what are my earliest memories of Jesus? And Mm -hmm. my earliest memories of Jesus were quite, um, they were very warm and it was almost like Jesus was an invisible playmate. And um, I make kind of fun of that because of course um, my atheist friends always say, you know, God is like your invisible friend. And my, my response is, well, what's wrong with that? You know, <laughs> especially, you know, during the pandemic, we've all needed uh-huh. invisible friends. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> so um so I take this idea of friendship, which is often, it's not just atheists that's kind of look down on that idea with scorn, but I've often heard, you know, preachers, um, particularly male preachers say, oh, you know, Jesus can't be your friend. Jesus is your Lord, you know? And so really divide those two or um, even my friends make fun of what they call Jesus is my boyfriend music, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so we take the, this idea of friend and we've, um, you know, we kind of feminized it as an insult and we, we certainly infantilized, infantilized it mm-hmm. um, as an insult. And um, yet, wow, you know, there's a huge arc of uh, biblical narrative about God as our friend And then, of course, in the highlight of Jesus' discourse in the latter chapters of John, right before the crucifixion, um, Jesus literally says that to his Mm -hmm. disciples, I no longer call you servants or or slaves. There's Uh kind of some interesting ways of interpreting that. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friend. And the radicalness of that within the cultural context that Jesus said those words, uh, uh, or of course the words being attributed to Jesus in that discourse. I mean, they're just enormous. And they say so much about the early church's idea of the relationality that we have with God and the intimacy that we have with God. So, so So that's the biblical narrative, but you ask about the historical part. And it was several years ago, almost a decade now, I guess, Uh is that I discovered that my oldest um, American family um, had come from uh, Scotland and also the north of England. And 
somehow both of these streams of family got here uh, to the new world before 1660. And both of the streams of that family were Quakers. So they were, or they became Quakers when they were here because Quakerism was wow. sort of just beginning to come to be actually mm -hmm. at that very time. So it's a little hard to tell if they converted when they were England and they, in the England and Scotland and they escaped or how that happened. But clearly by the time my family has records, extant records of these people, which is in the late 1660s and through the 1670s forward, is that they're all Quakers. And um, the Quakers, of course, uh, Quaker is the nickname, kind of a rude nickname assigned yeah. to them mm -hmm. because they, their bodies shook when they had mm -hmm. sort of these these encounters with God. It was a very ecstatic kind of thing at the early stages. Um, but their real name was the Society of Friends. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the idea was that they were friends with God and friends with one another. And that this idea emerged within the context of mid 17th century English culture, which was so rigidly hierarchical. English culture is still hierarchical, but a little less so than it was yeah. um, 400 years ago. And um, so, so it has this really, you know, so demanding hierarchy. And what happened was the, the, if you were a friend, if you were part of the society friends and say you were walking down the street and the local squire, you know, the Lord was walking toward you, the expectation in England is that, you know, you would step aside and you would slightly bow your head and you would say, my Lord or my lady, you know, and um, the Quakers didn't do that. Um, instead, they literally just stood there and said, um, how art thou today, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, we think of that as like this, you know, very formal address, how art thou today, you know, or what have you. And um, actually thou in English yeah. back at that time mm -hmm. is the familiar form of you. It's like the mm -hmm. do in German. Um, and so what happened was the Quaker was basically saying, Hey buddy, what's going on today? Or what you, what you up to mate? You know, and literally the English hierarchy went insane um, because the Quakers not only treated everybody the same from the squire to the lowest of the low, the slaves and women and black people, everybody got treated the same. And, mm -hmm. and they also believed that everyone was in, inhabited um, inherently by the light of God. And so, you know, that got away with priestly hierarchies as well as social hierarchies. Yeah. And so, so you have this entire religious movement that's uh, based around this con concept of friendship with God and friendship with one another. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, you know, no yeah. wonder when I went back to that as a, a an idea theologically, uh -huh. yeah, um, it sort of resonates with my really, my deepest DNA spiritually. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you talking about that. And then you did share in the book that you do often go to some Quaker meetings. I thought that was very interesting too. And I, you know, um, because of lack of time, just a few more things and then we'll wrap up. You began the book about, uh, you know, in scripture, it says, uh, they asked you, um, now I can't remember, but who do you say that I am? Right, that right. scriptural question, who do you say that I am? And I thought the way you wrote that piece, I thought was so beautiful because I think, you know, you're really asking the relational question and the who and not the what. So that you said it so beautifully. And I think we get so wrapped up with what all the time, you know, what did you do today? You know, what book did you read? What book did you write? You know, everything is about doing, doing, doing. But even when we think of the language, the word human beings, it's not human doings, it's human beings. And we don't concentrate on the being. And you really, you know, reminded me again about being. And I think that, it, you know, is all tied in with, you know, your concept of Quakerism and, you know, the being part, being in silence with God. And then the last chapter, you know, every chapter was interesting. It just, we don't have a couple of days to talk about your whole book, but even the presence, the presence of God, the being of God, I thought you just wrote it so beautifully and it just pushed me to think more deeply um, 
of my relationship to Jesus and to God and even my own personhood. So if you can just say a bit more about that. The part that you refer to, of course, yeah. is at the very beginning, I yeah. talk about Paul's mm -hmm. experience on the Damascus road and yeah. how this experience of Paul and Jesus is so foundational to everything that becomes Christian theology. You know, no experience, no Christian, no, no, no Paul, no theology, no New Testament. And so, so I went back and I thought a lot about that experience. And I reread all those parts where in the New Testament where that's either written about in Acts or where Paul's recalling it in his own letters. And um, you know, the the first thing that Paul asks when this 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 light hits you know whenever this thing is it strikes him down on the road um which he comes to understand is god but the first thing he says is who are you lord and that was the same kinds of kind of question that struck me is that it's not a question of what's going on here or <laughs> why did you do this <laughs> or, or what you know it's or, or or what's happening or how is this happening to me you know it's it's none of those kinds of questions it's literally a question who are you lord who are you and um that seems to me that 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 is not only key uh for understanding paul because i think that the the whole Pauline corpus of letters is that Paul is trying to understand who he met on that road and that it, it becomes Paul's sort of underlying question for the whole of Paul's journey. And um, he doesn't say that Jesus is one thing. Uh, the images that he presents for Jesus throughout his the letters are surprisingly numerous. And um, you know, brilliant, you know, Jesus's wisdom, mystery, cosmic, you know, sort of ruler, um, friend, I, it, Jesus, is, Jesus is all kinds of things uh, to Paul. And so Paul's always there. And that question, who are you, Lord, is Paul's question. But then it occurred to me, it's our question. Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. it, if indeed, that is sort of the animating question of a journey with Jesus. That's why I wrote that section, that that's the first question. And it's the most important question. It's the question yeah. of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so that is really the framework for the whole of the book is that to, for, for me in the text of my experience to ask over and over again on the road of life, who are you? Who are you, Lord? Yeah. And so these six different images are the dominant images yeah. um, of Jesus that I've experienced, not the only ones, the, just the dominant ones. And yeah. um, I, I actually, when I went back and I read the book again, right before it went to its final draft to the publisher, there's a way in which the book sort of ends after chapter five, which is the point of the story in which my personal life issues seem somewhat resolved. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I've been through this terrible divorce and there's a, this sort of harrowing, um, really theological escape that I pull off from uh, a very conservative Calvinist reformed world. And so, so that resolves itself at the end of chapter five, the end of chapter five, I don't wanna spoil it too much, but, um, a lot of the things that had really puzzled me for the first four decades of my life uh, kind of come to an end. They're resolved at the end of chapter five. And so I thought to myself, well, was that it? <laughs> was, was that really the, like, sort of the end of my own life? You know, is that you learn everything by the time you're 40 and then it's all over. And then I realized, oh my gosh, no. And, um, Chapter six really becomes a deep dive into uh, my experience, certainly of, of marriage and motherhood, um, which are very important for me, but I don't want that to turn off people who 
are not married and who aren't mothers, because I think there's a lot in the chapter about bodies and mm -hmm. uh, relationships and ordinary life and all kinds of things that people can find attractive. So yeah. that, but that last chapter becomes a kind of a, I don't know, it's, 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 there's something to it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I I liked that last chapter because yeah, me too. You quoted me. No, and then you quoted <laughs> me. I thought because I was I did. I quoted you. I know. <laughs> I didn't think. You know, I remember when I was tweeting, I was just taking quotes out of my book that was coming out, Hope and Disarray. And then you messaged me and I thought, oh, you know, people do that. And it's never going to make it in. But when it made when it made it in, that's like now I love this chapter even more. <laughs> So to get the quote, you have to read the book, Freeing Jesus. And I just, you know, we can have this conversation all day long, but I know you have a million other things that's going on. So thank you, Diana, for writing this book. Even if it was just for me, I really appreciate it. But I know it's going to be for the millions of people, you know, Christians and non-Christians. I think this is like a book that people should read. And, and be challenged by, I thought the book challenged me a lot and made me rethink about my own childhood understanding and my own church upbringing and how I need to even go forward. So I, you know, it's very rare when a book challenges that, you that much, especially a book for not just scholars, but for everybody, like the general public. So I just was so enriched by your book. So thank you for writing it and thank you for letting me read it and thank you for having uh letting me actually ask you all these questions and I wish I had more time so thank you so much Diana I I'm looking forward to the next book that you're writing I'm sure you've already probably started that already so I look <laughs> forward to the next one <laughs> so thank you so much because I remember you said one time the world is your classroom and it really is you teach us so much in this book so thank you so much for doing that. Well, I'm just delighted that it spoke to you as strongly as it obviously has, because if it didn't, I'd be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and you well, did like just, I'm... you did with it just what I'm dreaming that every wonderful reader will do. And that is memoir is ultimately not about me, you know, um, to write my memoir is if it was just about me, it would be so dull. Um, but memoir is, is using our lives as a text mm -hmm. in order to see the world and understand more deeply how to live fully, yeah. you know, where God is, you know, the big question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what a good memoir does is it, it provides that perspective from one person's voice but a good one then says, my voice isn't the only voice. Mm -hmm. As, and yeah. so what happens with good memoir is it, it invites readers into their own story yeah. and to imagine how their story interfaces with, with my story and interfaces with God's story. Uh -huh. And then, you know, the whole, yeah. so it becomes a much bigger thing. And so that's what you did so naturally. And that's what I hope everybody who reads this book well, will do. Well, the thing is, you did it so beautifully. It just came naturally. And then it, now it challenges me as I write, you know, going forward from today. It's like, how can I write so beautifully like Diana? <laughs> that's, that's oh, gosh. For me. It's like, you just spoke right to me. And, you know, you didn't share all the good parts of your life. You shared some of the difficulty. And that's <laughs> always hard to do but you shared it in a way to invite us readers. And, you know, because I write too, I'm like, that's at art. Not anybody can do that, but you <laughs> did it so beautifully. Well, it's hard and to so write about some of the things that I put in there without it being, you know, maudlin or, you know, overwrought. Uh, so, you, you did know, it so beautifully. And I, I'm sure writing was, is understated, I think. Well, you know, that's a big challenge. So I have to read it again. So I can figure out how you did it so well. I have to find out what your trick is. But it, you just did it so well. And I just thank you so much for doing that. And I just look forward to the next book that you're writing. I'm sure it's all in your head right now. So thank you. Thank no, you for the, No, <laughs> no I got work to do. <laughs> 
conversation. I thought, you know, because you began by saying you had all these other chapters. I thought any of those that didn't make it into the book could be your next book. I think I always say waste not. I don't waste a thing. If something doesn't get in one book, I put it in the next book. That's my trick. I don't know. Good for you. But it may not be good because it may be horrible stuff that I'm just, it didn't make it in this book. (laughs) Maybe that's been my (laughs) But I thought the way, when I first asked you the question, I thought some of those other things sounded so interesting. Maybe that should be your next book. Yeah, whatever it is. I have a couple of different projects rattling around and something will come loose. My, there's one idea that my publisher is really pressing me towards and I'm just kind of not. Tell us, uh, tell us as we end. (laughs) uh, Well, it's a sort of a historical, it's, it's a different kind of piece. It's a historical essay on fundamentalism, interestingly enough. Oh, I think you should do that one. No, because so that is, so is, that my is publisher. So, yeah, that is such a needed book. I thought Frame Jesus was much needed, but that fundamentalism, it's like so many of us have gone through it yeah. and are trying to recover from it too. I think, please, please write it, Diana. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Th- and thank well, you for having me. Well, thank you. This is my first Ma dog. <laughs> I learned a new word. I mean, what a lovely, what a lovely conception. I thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll say more about it when I uh, introduce this whole episode, what the Madang is. So it's to invite people into the courtyard and people, I hope that people will create their own and that other people will be talking about your book in either in Bible study groups, church groups, in seminaries, undergrad, everywhere. I hope people will read it and discuss it and create their own madang, uh, a courtyard to do that. So thank you again for writing and thank you so much for being my first guest on this madang episode. So we'll talk more again. Thank you so much, Diana. And Many blessings to you and your family as we are trying to get through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Grace.